Good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to a combined meeting of budget and property. It's a two for one. So thanks for joining us this evening. I uh, will try to be as expedient as possible. Um, if you look in the chat, it will give you a link uh, to our presentations this evening. Um, as usual, uh, thank you for your attendance and any and all questions are welcomed. Mr. Cuff. You're muted, Mr. Cuff. Oh, no, you're not. I'm off now. Okay. Everyone can see, hopefully. So what we'll do, the first um, on our agenda discussing this evening will be Edmund from Barbara King Thornton, and we'll let him give a quick synopsis of the audit report. Yep, thank you, Jeff. Uh, good evening, everyone. Um, I, I believe last year I met with the same uh, committee and, and did the presentation. Um, so one year on, I'm, I'm back here again. Uh, so as Jeff said, um, this presentation is just to you know provide you with the results of the audit. I'm not going to go through um, a lot of numbers because you know the the monthly reports that you know are being submitted to the board each month you know reflect the final numbers from the audit. Um, we did not have a lot of you know audit adjustments on our end you know which will uh, materially change the monthly reports that you you, you get. Uh, so just jumping straight into the results. Uh, we issued our modified opinions um, on the financial statements, um, meaning we, we, we issued clean opinions on the financial statements uh, this year. Um, the report is finalized. It was dated uh, December 21st, uh, 2022. Um, just a few things I wanted to note. Uh, so once the report is finalized, you know, we submit to the federal or declaring house. Um, there's also a submission done with the state. And then your uh, bonds also require, uh, you know, the report to be submitted um, to them as well. So I believe um, all those filings will be done within the appropriate uh, time thresholds, and you meet all your, you know, filing deadlines uh, as well. Um, the audit was done in, in accordance with um, generally accepted U.S. auditing standards and um, governmental auditing standards. Uh, th those are the standards that we use to. To, to perform the audit uh, of, of the school. Uh, important to note, um, there were no significant deficiencies in, in your internal controls. You know, as part of the audit process, we do review the internal controls that the school has in place to make sure they're operating effectively uh, and also to make sure, you know, management is following the approved policies and procedures that are in place. Uh, you know, we, we do uh, pull a sample of expenditures, you know, go through the, the cycle to make sure everything is operating well. Uh, we did not have any significant deficiencies in internal control, no material weaknesses. However, last year, if you remember, we had a finding relating to uh, bank reconciliations, which were not being performed on a monthly basis. Uh, this year, you know, obviously during the current year audit, we came back, looked at that. So that finding has been cleared. The bank breaks are now being done on a monthly basis. They are being reviewed and approved by somebody independent of the person uh, performing those bank breaks. Uh, so there were no new findings this year as part of the audit process. Jeffy, uh, yep. Actually, I think you skipped one. Yeah, there you. Yeah. The next page will be for uh, the single audit. Yeah, there you go. Um, also, as part of the audit process, uh, because you do receive more than $750,000 in federal funds, uh, we do a separate audit called a single audit. And this pretty much uh, reports on your compliance with federal requirements with those federal dollars that are coming into the district to make sure you know, you're complying with all the stipulations that they put on the use of those funds. Um, so this year, we did look at the child nutrition cluster. And uh, we did look at the um, education establishment fund, the SF program. You know, this is pretty much new funding. So it was deemed high risk by the federal government. So we had to look at it irrespective of, you know, any other programs that we looked at this year. Uh, we did not have any compliance, uh, non-compliance noted, and no, you know, internal control related items noted as part of the uh, single audit as well. Uh, so with this 
this is what I was saying that once, because you had a single audit, we have to submit it to the federal audit clearing house. So you meet your reporting deadlines. Um, that is in progress. I believe, Bob, if I'm not mistaken, um, that submission was done today. It's probably not here, but yeah, that's the submission um, will, will be done today or was done today. So you met that uh, reporting deadline as well. If we can move on to the next page, please. All right. So as you know, as a school district, you know, importantly, you know, fund balance is always, a, you know, an important resource to know what, what your fund balance is. And it's pretty much, you know, what the school has available to, to use for um, uh, future years, right? So what I did was I just compared 2022 and 2021 um, just to give you an idea of what excuse me, just to give you an idea of what the fund balance looked like. Uh, so when we look at the general fund, uh, general fund fund balance decreased by $1.9 million. Uh, so it went from um, $2.26 million to $373,000. Uh, and if you look at the capital projects fund too, it decreased by 359,000. And the debt service fund also decreased a little bit. Um, However, there was um, a transfer from the um, general fund to the debt service fund pretty much every year to pay for, uh, you know, for debt, you know, the bonds that, that you incur. So that's, you know, comparing your 2021, uh, 2022, I believe, you know, you're probably already aware of, you know, the, the how, you know, your fund balance is looking as, as, of the, as of the year end pretty much. So just wanted to throw that in there just to give you an idea of what, what, what it, was, it was looking like. All right, uh, we can jump. And was it in 2020 that we had a fund balance of 2.4 million? Is that why that 2.2 is, see that 2.2 on the slide above 2021? Yes, that's uh, your 20, that's your 2021 general fund fund balance. So to answer your question, question Jen, yeah, the year before it was 2.4. Right, right, okay, yeah. So yeah, in 2020. Uh, on the next slide, I'm we're sorry. looking at. Um... Can you go back to that slide for a second? I'm sorry. Yeah, go ahead. Yes, no problem. So we entered the 2022 with 2.2, right? Correct. Yes. Our fund balance. And then we used 1.6 to, um, as in the document that we're going to review after this, then we used 1.6 for personnel and other education stuff? Correct, yes. Okay. All right, thank you. Yeah. So I just to clarify that, so pretty much what this is, you know, your revenues that came in were less than your total expenditures. So your revenues that came in were less than your total expenditures in the general fund by $1.9 million. So that would reduce your fund balance from 2021 Got it. By, by that same amount, yeah. All right. So uh, the other important thing to look at is, you know, your revenues and your expenditures. Um, so what I did here was, you know, take the general fund, you know, as you know, other than the capital projects and the food service, everything else that a school district does goes through your general fund. So, you know, to give you an idea of what your revenues look like, uh, your revenues um, increase actually by um, $980,000 um, comparing 2021 and 2022. And the biggest increase um, here is from your state funding. Your state funding actually increased uh, substantially by $838,000, um, you know, year over year. Uh, however, your expenditures, as, we, as you know, I noted in the previous slide, uh, increased by $3.1 million, right, from, from the previous year. So the net amount, you know, contributes to the decrease in, in your fund balance. Um, However, uh, there was also a transfer of $1.5 million from the general fund to the debt service fund to fund, um, you know, debt service payments. Uh, all right. And, you know, just quickly touched on the pensions, just to give you an idea of, you know, this, the district really has no control over this. You know, this is it's on the statewide level. Uh, these are your uh, pensions, pieces. 
you know, funding, you know, improved, you know, in 20, you know, 2022 compared to 2021, it was at 54.32%, you know, increased to 63.67%. So it's, it's trending in the right direction. Uh, hopefully someday, you know, the, it, it will be hundred percent funded, you know, it will probably, probably take a while for that to happen. Um, but, you know, that's, that's the hope. Uh, and then on the other side, you know, there's a small portion of your pension contributions which goes towards your um, OPEP, other post-employment benefits, and that funding is around 5% for, for both years uh, as well. You know, important to note, this district, you know, met all the contribution requirements, you know, all the uh, payments that were due to um, PISAs were done and, you know, or, or accrued for uh, by the end of the year. So they, 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 they met uh, those requirements as well. Uh, yep. So as I noted earlier, uh, no current year findings. Mm -hmm. um, there was one prior year finding that has been cleared, which related to bank recs. So as it stands now, this year you have no open um, audit findings at the end of June 30th, 2022. And then just a few communication items, you know, like I mentioned, you know, we had, you know, minor adjustments, uh, which were posted by management. Um, and um, I want to thank uh, Bob, you know, Jeff and, and their team for, for the assistance they provided us during the audit process. You know, it's very intensive, you know, with, with a short window of, you know, coming in and trying to get the audit done and, you know, to meet all your important deadlines. So we do take a lot of their time during this process, you know, in addition to their regular, you know, day-to-day, -day, uh, you know, uh, responsibilities. So we just want to thank them for the assistance they provide us uh, each year uh, doing all the process. Yeah. So yeah, that's a quick overview of the results for the year. If there are any questions, I believe myself, Bob or Jeff will be able to answer um, any questions that you might have. Um, Edwin, thank you so much. Um, did we include, I understand that um, the mandatory school board training can be included in um, our audit. Is that in, I, and I got the audit late yesterday, so didn't get a chance to go through every page, but I will. Um, is that included in your audit? Coming in, I missed the first part of your- um, uh, school, uh, The state of Pennsylvania has mandatory school board director training. Um, that information, can be included in an audit as to school board directors completing that requirement. Um, have you included that in this audit? Within the scope of this audit? I'm sorry. I'm a little, yes, as, you know, so it, just to I'll answer the question, and if, if I'm wrong, you let me know. Um, so, yes, you know, as part of the process, we do what we call a risk assessment, you know, approach. And, you know, we'll, we'll look at, you know, items that will impact on, you know, the, the financial amounts and all that. Um, in terms of board training, we, you know, once we do the assessment and we have to do additional testing relating to that, you know, we'll do that to see if that was done, you know, but this cycle, we didn't look at that requirement as, as part of the risk assessment procedures that was done. Okay. However, you know, each year when we look at the cycle, we decide what additional testing we have to do because it's like a non-financial requirement. You know, we, we do the risk assessment and, and, and decide what additional testing we have to do relating to, to those you know, items outside of the main core, uh, you know, financial requirements that, that we have. So uh, it could be included depending on, you know, what the risk assessment that we do each year. Um, I, I would ask, uh to consult with Ms. Boykins, um, Mr. Cuff, and Dr. B. Coates about including that in the future. I think it's a, an important thing to, that's the only place it can, it, that I've been told it can be shared. And uh, I think it's important to show our um, citizens that we are um, complying with the law as it pertains to school board training. Right. And actually, Jen, what I can do is I can share that with the 
Um, one of the people on the Pasville Accounting Board to see if they can get that push more. I don't think a lot of districts actually had that part of their um, thing, but yeah. I will share. I, I'll share it with one of the reps at the, um, the, the Vasbo in the Pasbo because they they have an accounting group, and I can share that with them. Right. Yeah, um, yeah, I understand. A lot of school boards aren't showing it, but it is law, and uh, I think we should. Okay. Um, but I, I don't get to make that decision. So if you can consult with others over that decision. Yep. I'm making a note of it and it will be followed up on. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So that's what Ed, and that's Edmonds. Um, whoa, there you go. Okay. So what, and I'll, I'm going to double back on one of the items that Edmund brought up about our fund balance. As Edmund had stated, our fund balance at the beginning of the 21 22 school year was at $2.2 million. Um, and the next slide, or unless anyone had a chance to review the slide, you'll see that this is a slide from the 21-22 budget prep or budget preparation time, where a decision was made that we would in, intentionally or predetermined amount to draw down some of that fund balance. So in that range, we determined we were gonna draw down $1.83 million, $1.8 million. And I go back, you'll see there, there's a predetermined amount that we drew that down. And we actually had to use another $80,000 to cover expenses for the remainder of the school year. And that's how we came up at our fund balance at $373,000. So I say that as, as going forward, it's important that we make that we make the decisions of whether or not we want to use all of our fund balance or use some of our fund balance. And I, I think a fund balance, maintaining a strong fund balance is probably good for the district as we as you go forward and particularly with a lot of the construction items that we have coming forward. Right, um, to, to put a sort of nail on that point, we will pay a higher interest rate for a lower fund balance, correct? That is potentially, yes. Yeah, so either way, we're going to pay, but. Okay. So what I'll do is I'll, we will swing now over to the, oh, Emin, I thank you for your time. I don't, I, I'm not sure how much you want to hang around, but you're welcome to. Um, yeah. So we'll, yes, I'm sorry. If I may, do any school board directors have a question on the uh, budget part of this meeting? I have, I have one question or comment maybe uh i was late getting on so maybe i missed something uh so you're saying there as of now the fund balance is 373,447 correct yes so uh isn't that something to be alarmed about that we're operating with a fund balance at that low rate, that low amount? I would say yes, it is. But again, in the, at the time that this was approved, we intentionally knew that we would, you know, that, that we were going to be decreasing the fund balance because we did not want to increase taxes. And I believe that was also, for lack of better terms, the, the last year of COVID and we were trying to take into account what residents were going through, et cetera. Um, that is not the intent or the ultimate goal, um, but that decision was made at the time that we approved the budget. And I would, um, one saving grace is that we had underestimated for once in our lives, uh, how much the state was gonna give us uh, as our funding number. Uh, because they passed their budget well after ours. So um, we have over 5 million in the fund balance now, correct? Well, it's, nothing is there yet. At the end of the year, that, that would be the projection. Okay. So um, because we did not allocate for that extra money that we received from the state um, in the way of state funding, I. Uh, so um, it, it will get refreshed, but it is, uh, as you know, Ms. Richardson, a uh, dangerous precedent. Yeah. So the, you're saying the five, the, it, the five, the fund balance bill will be refreshed with that $5 million, give or take. 
Is that yes. my understanding? It, it should be at the end of this fiscal year, correct? Because as Ms. Hoff stated, this year there was there were additional funding provided from the state and level up that was beyond what we had forecast. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. The only comment that I would make is to concur with Ms. Luella and, and Dr. Because that the, a strong fund balance, I believe, is essential. It is. Definitely. Some hard decisions ahead. Okay. You're good. Okay. Thank you. Um, so we'll start with the property committee. And I believe that Mike, Mike, I believe you want to share the screen, if I'm correct. And, and Jeff, if I could, please, before Mike starts, I did ask David Kahn to join us because I wanted to make sure that everyone was on the same page with the legal requirement that we have as a school district around picking the lowest responsible bid. So if you could just highlight that, because I think that's important for everyone to understand and be on the same page with as we begin to look at the information that um, Mike will be sharing with us tonight. Sorry about that. Yeah, no, I, I, I appreciate that. Um, and, and most of this, I think all of you will already know. Um, so obviously the school code and the state procurement code both separately impose on public entities like William Penn, the obligation to put items out for public bid and to award those bids to the lowest responsible bidder. Um, and, and so, you know, a number of years ago, not that long ago, you know, five, six, seven, eight years ago, a number of municipalities and a few schools started adopting at, um, responsible contractor ordinances, um, which were designed to target essentially union shops. And all of us at the time who did this wondered whether courts were going to allow that to happen. Um, the way they work is to essentially make part of your bid specifications the kinds of things that only union shops can provide so that contractors have to have an apprenticeship program, et cetera, et cetera. Um, they did get challenged. And as it never went to the Pennsylvania Supreme Court, I don't think, but I'm quite certain the Commonwealth Court ultimately approved the use of those kinds of additions to your bid specifications. So it opened a little bit of a door, but if we're talking about um, different criteria that we are then going to add to our bid specification. Like there's nothing we can do that gets us out of the requirement to go through the public bidding process and to award to the lowest responsible bid. That is an absolute legal requirement. There, no school district can evade it. Um, and, and I know it's not the intent to evade it. Um, so, so, but if we add other criteria to our bid specifications, um, I, I do, you know, the board needs to know that those might be subject to challenge by a disappointed bidder. Um, some disappointed bidder who was ruled out because they failed to meet those specifications and therefore were ruled not a responsible bidder might well go to court and say, hey, this is beyond the authority of a school board to define what responsible means under the bidding law. So, so that's the landscape we're in. I, I applaud the effort. I think it's a great idea. I just want to make sure everybody's kind of doing it with their eyes wide open. And just one last thing, as most of us know, we do not have a policy right now for RCO. That is something that I did provide to the board, a sample copy of that. And we will have further discussion about that item at the appropriate committee meeting. Thanks, David. Sure. And, and if there are no questions, I'm going to sign off. But uh, Dr. Beacoats also has my cell phone number. So if anything weird comes up, he can text me. Thank you, Mr. Kahn. Ken, do you want me to jump ahead here? Go for it. Yeah, go ahead, Mike. All right, great. Can everybody see the screen? It says bid results. Yep. All right. So uh, evening, everybody. Thank you for having me. We're um, here tonight for um, uh, good good reasons. We're, we have positive bids that uh, came in for uh, the two projects. I want to review those, answer any questions you have. Um, we always talk about the big night when the school boards spend a lot of money. That's um, Monday night. So Monday night in front of you will be the motion to consider uh, awarding these bids. That would be the time where you are 
contractually obligating yourself to the uh, lowest contractors here that we'll present tonight, um, and essentially financially committing uh, to the uh, ESSER projects um, at East Lansdowne and Evans. Uh, so we're going to review that tonight, answer any questions you have, and uh, again, kind of set you up for, um, for next Monday. So diving right in, um, the schedule that we've been showing for a while, um, we were out to bid, we had walkthroughs, we had two walkthroughs actually with contractors on the 21st of December and the 9th of January. So here we are tonight on uh, the 19th. Uh, on the 17th, just two days ago, we opened bids at the district offices. I'll review those with you. And as I said, uh, on Monday, the 23rd, the board will consider um, moving ahead with the project. If you do, the, the construction is essentially four phases. It's two summers uh, and then the fall and the spring kind of in between. So there'll be a lot of work in the summer of 23, a lot of work in the summer of 24, and um, a little less work uh, in between those times. Um, some renovation uh, of classrooms and things, but a little less going on during the school year uh, as to not uh, disrupt education. So the um, the estimates in the past, we had uh, about a six and a half million dollar construction project for East Lansdowne. That's the construction cost. Now, total project cost includes fees and permits and, and several other things, uh, um, contingencies as well, money set aside. Uh, for the inevitable extra charges and things that'll happen as we we start to renovate the buildings. And I'll go over that as well. So you looked at a total project of about $8 million. At Evans, we were at eight and a half for construction. That equaled about 10.2 for uh, total projects. So we were looking at an estimate of about $15 million for the construction cost. So that's the number we're going to compare um, with the, the bids that came in with about a total estimate of about 18.2. Uh, and that's what the last time that we met with the board in, in October kind of shared that. Uh, and those are very similar to the numbers we've been talking about uh, all along. They aligned with the numbers from the third party um, agency that reviewed all the projects and things like that. So uh, that's where we were heading into Tuesday. Um, so we received 17 bids uh, from a variety of companies. Um, we were very happy. It was a room full of people. Um, you know, anytime uh, there's a lot of work out there, you know, you're concerned, you want to make sure that we're competitive. So you want to see a lot of different companies competing. Um, and uh, so it's having 17 different bids uh, for the four uh, contracts, again, general contractor, mechanical, electrical, and plumbing. So it's four different contracts. Uh, having 17 different groups was, uh, was great. Uh, the lowest uh, apparent bidders as of right now um, uh, the first is SP Conrad, who's a Delaware County company. Um, they were the lowest for general construction. That's kind of what it sounds like. Everything that isn't mechanical, electrical, and plumbing. So flooring, the windows uh, at East Lansdowne, ceilings, um, the elevators, and things like that. That's all kind of the general contractor. Uh, Phillips Brothers, uh, who's a, a group in Chester County. And then Myco Mechanical was actually the low for plumbing and for mechanical. Um, even though they have mechanical in their name, they actually do uh, all three trades, uh, but they were the low for plumbing and mechanical, which actually is advantageous. So now we're talking about one company for two different uh, contracts. So we'd be signing four different contracts, four different um, primes, but we only have three different groups. So that actually helps. It'll help during construction uh, to have you know one less group that we have to uh, coordinate with. Uh, as I mentioned, all three are local uh, to the uh, Delaware County area. Um, we've worked and are working actually currently with all three of them. Phillips Brothers is the electrical contractor up in uh, Upper Darby right now at Aronimic Elementary School. We've worked with Michael all over the place. Con uh, SB Conrad just completed Haverford High School, which was something that we worked on with them. Uh, and as I mentioned, you know, uh, they're, they're a Delaware County group. Uh, so the total bids came in at um, just the base bids uh, at $12.9 million. That's about $2 million under budget. Um, from where we are before. So that's obviously tremendous. It's a much better conversation to have being under budget than over budget. Um, and uh, that is the base bid. So um, that is just the um, base amount of work uh, that we've been describing. We asked alternates or we asked contractors to bid six alternates. These are things that we all deemed had a lot of value, um, but weren't necessarily the absolute core essence of um, indoor air quality, ADA compliance, and things like that. Um, so these were all things that, again, we recommended, thought were good ideas, but to be careful in case we were over budget by, you know, 100000 or so, we wanted to make sure we had a couple of options to uh, to move around. So 
Um, these are some things to consider and I'll go over each tonight. Uh, the first is new gym windows at East Lansdowne. Um, we also had an alternate for an additional classroom window at East Lansdowne and I'm gonna go through each of these. Uh, replacing some casework at Evans uh, Jan, Jeff, and Dr. Beacoats, the summary I sent you on Tuesday said that there was casework at East Lansdowne. It's extra casework at Evans Elementary School. Um, replacing terminal heating units, I'll show you where that is, kitchen units at both schools, um, and, and adding what's called bipolar ionization to HVAC units. Um, that is an add-on to um, the air conditioning uh, system that actually cleans the air a little bit uh, even better. Um, so all six of those if you considered um, moving ahead with those and we are recommending uh, each of them because we do think they, they bring value. Uh, that's an additional 691,000 uh, in bidding alternates. Uh, again, we, we think they all enhanced uh, the school. I'm gonna go over each individually. Uh, if you included that, the total contract amount then would be $13.6 million, which is still about $1.3 million um, under budget. So I'm gonna go through each alternate quickly, and then I'll stop I, for questions. Can I ask so you a question, ahead. Mike? Or I'll stop right now. Go ahead. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, can you go back to that slide? Sure. Um, so the new gym, when I went to the East Lansdowne presentation, the new gym window was presented as um, something that was going to be done, um, as, a dish, as was the classroom windows. Um, nothing was said about the casework at Evans. Um, the terminal heating units at both schools seems like an important thing. So those are electric. They are um, basically heaters in corridors and in stair towers and in vestibules. They're kind of things on their own. They just kind of sit there and blow hot air. Right. Um, it is not tied into the larger building system. Um, they're on their own. You have them now. Uh, there's about, I think in the slide coming up, I want to say there's about 17 of them total between two buildings. Um, so I'll, I'll get to those when we when I describe each one individually, but they are um, heating units that are in both buildings now. They're 15 to 20 years old. They're right. no. fine, but you know that's about as long as the last. So um, it was one of those things that we said, listen, if we're going to do everything, and again, we can talk about it and you can choose to do it or not. Um, you know, we like to renovate a school and then be done. Right. Um, so you don't want to do all this and then have, you know. No, I agree. Um, uh, the bipolar back. ionization was presented as something that was going to be done at the East Lansdowne meeting. And number five, I wondered if um, we could shift that cost over to our food service with our food service money uh, because it has to do directly with food service. Mm -hmm. But uh, Go ahead. I, I just so, want to so these clear. were 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 presented as, and again, these are all things that you can certainly choose. Um, but we did purposely kind of pull them out because um, you know adding all of them up are about seven hundred thousand dollars, so it's a lot of money. Um, but those are things that um, we pulled out to ensure that the base bid was um, on target. Um, these are again all things that uh, we think are are good and and enhance the values of um, an educational space of the building, um, but weren't you know absolutely one hundred percent necessary to the original uh, scope that the board had asked right. us to look at. My only point is that most of them were presented as part of the project in our presentation to East Lansdowne last week. Okay. Um, so the first one, um, the gym windows. Um, as you can see on the left, that's the outside of the uh, of the school. There's a lot of windows at East Lansdowne that got essentially boarded up over time. Uh, the original building had windows, and um, as we've seen in Pennsylvania, uh, a lot of windows back in the day were um, single glaze, meaning it's only just one piece of kind of flimsy glass, so a lot of heat would escape. Now we have insulated windows, which are two panes of glass, insulated frames. Things are much more energy efficient. Um, but back in, say, the 50s and 60s, they kind of saw them as areas of heat loss. So they bored them up. Uh, they blocked them up. Um, you have that at the front of the school uh, as well. I'll show you that in a moment. Um, so this was an idea of opening them back up again. The holes are already there. The masonry is already held up. Uh, this is essentially just opening them up uh, and putting uh, new windows in. They're very large windows. Um, but you can see the difference uh, and just the feel of, of what that may look like. 
um, in the gym there at East Lansdowne. Uh, the second piece here um, were windows in, in the classroom. So this is a picture of a typical classroom at East Lansdowne. The two windows that are here um, are not insulated. So again, they're single, single glazed glass. They're, they're not providing a lot of heat insulation at all. Those would be replaced. That's part of the base bid uh, of the project. There used to be four windows in each of these classrooms. So the let's call it the third one, that hole will be reopened, but that's going to be reopened because that's where the new HVAC unit is going. So from the outside right now, you kind of see stucco. What you'll see is a window frame that'll look similar to the other two window frames, except this window frame won't have any glass in it. It'll have a large louver. That's where the air is coming in into that unit to provide fresh air uh, into the space. So this is all part of the base bid project. This is all in the original uh, um, number. This one is not. Um, essentially, that window there would be um, a third window uh, into the classroom. Um, again, we can do that or not. Um, there's 14 of them. Um, so you kind of divide that out. You can see how much that is per window. Um, and that would be, again, something we thought was nice to include, uh, add a little bit more natural light into the space. Uh, you can see here they're using that wall. <laughs> um, so they're using that for, for pinup space and things like that. Um, we can consider this um, or not. Uh, so that's something uh, that was alternate to. Uh, the third one here is casework. So now we're, we're showing a picture of Evans. Uh, there are 13 classrooms where we have uh, existing sinks that are over here that are not ADA compliant. So in the bids, uh, we are replacing this sink, but we weren't replacing anything else. And there's not a lot of storage in those rooms. Um, so there's a lot of casework being proposed. This is, this is in 13 different classrooms. So call it about uh, 10 or $11,000 per classroom. You're looking at all new casework along that wall. So here's that sink that's already in the project. That sink would go fit in here and then you'd, we'd basically have the remaining casework to stay as is, or this would all be new casework. All the way across the bottom, a teacher's wardrobe here, an area here for desk and files, and then casework above uh, as well, a lot of cabinets and things like that on that upper level. So that is a tremendous amount of additional storage for those classrooms as opposed to what they have now. Um, again, we thought it was a good price having that, you know, about 10, 11,000 per classroom is a fair price if that's an, an added investment uh, that you're looking to upgrade from essentially this, this image here uh, to something that looks a little like that. Again, this is where the added casework would be. So again, in all of those cases, you can see these are things that would, would help, would be nice, but there's certainly dollar amounts associated to them. Um, so the other uh, three, um, the cabinet heaters, there are 20, I'm sorry, 20 units between uh, both schools. And again, if you walk through the hallways, walk through the, the vestibules, you just kind of see these guys sitting on the side, kind of just blowing hot air out. Um, you know, replacing those was, was recommended by the mechanical engineer. Um, the rooftop units at the at the kitchen, those are big, big, powerful HVAC units. So you're, you're at about 100,000 each, which is about what they cost. Um, again, they're working now, but this we thought was a good price if you wanted to replace them now or you could hold off. Um, but, you know, they're about um, they're pretty much past their useful life as well and could be uh, could expire at any time. Again, that's at both schools. Um, and then the air purification. This is. Um, What's, um, to get a little geeky on you, uh, everybody has, you know, filters and things like that, that has, um, that you, you may have in your house that collects dust and, you know, you're supposed to take them out every couple of months and clean them or throw them out. Um, and that's collecting dust. And it's a big filter that goes into um, part of your um, HVAC equipment. Um, what bioionization is, is an added, it's actually like a computer box that goes inside these units as well, that actually uses UV, UV rays as well as magnetic um, polar, that's the ionization part, uh, ways of pulling additional bacteria, things like that out of the air. Um, so while dust and things like that are particulates, you can kind of see them and they get caught in a mesh, um, things like biological um, hazards, let's say the common cold, the flu, let's say COVID, 
things like that that could be in the air. It's an additional way to clean those. We used to see bipolar ionization a lot in hospitals and things like that. Now you're seeing them a lot more in schools after COVID. Um, by putting this in, by no means means that we're curing COVID. Um, air needs to um, go up into the system, go into the system, get zapped, and then come back out clean. So it is a way to clean the air, to purify it, to filter it a little bit more than uh, a typical system, which is still going to be an, a huge upgrade from what you have. Um, but this was a way that would be in all of the units in all of the schools. So again, you're looking at 40 or 50 different units here. Um, that would include um, this additional purification of, of air um, being circulated in the classroom spaces. This also goes in the HVAC units, like uh, the gym units um, and, and some of those larger spaces like that. It's just kind of another, um, another additive uh, filtration system. So any questions with the alternates or any of that before I'm just going to break down the, the bidding and... and um, Kind of give some summary pieces there, but any questions on the alternates? Any discussion there? So my my only concern is the the extra windows taking away some um, wall space for mm -hmm. the teachers to use. The only concern that I have, I understand the need for this one for the HVAC unit, but that additional fourth window, I'd love to have extra light. But I've been in those rooms. There's not enough room to hang things mm -hmm. as is. Um, I I struggle with this one. I'd love to give them more light because, you know, seeing that vitamin D come in, you know, the glass stops it, but the light does, you know, improve the mood um, in, in the classroom. But at the same time, you know, as you shared, they use that wall. So that's, that's my only concern at this point. Um, I'm sure if we opened it up, they would in, they would appreciate the the extra light. But at the same time, it does decrease the amount of space that they can mm -hmm. uh, utilize in terms of putting things against and hanging things up on the wall. That those are, you know, it's a good thing to have um, this kind of problem. But it's you know um, that that's for teachers. Uh, I think that would be a great thing, but I don't. Uh, that would be something that. Um, Dr. B. Coates and, and Jeff would have to undertake to ask. And I don't know if there's enough time to, to get that survey completed before we authorize. You are correct, Jan. I yeah, I mean, if you look at the, the two existing windows that they have now will be replaced. Obviously, the, the large pane here that has the air conditioning in it will be a glass window. So you, you are gaining additional natural light into the space. Um, already just by replacing that. Um, this was something as as we were talking with the, the principal there, it, it was this exact discussion. Hey, that would be great to have additional natural light in the room, um, but we're losing some wall space. So we we said let's let's uh let's take a look. It doesn't hurt to to document it and show it that way and see uh see what the number comes in at. Um again, that size window, 14 of them. You know, budget-wise, I can tell you that's a good number, but that's a choice uh, of whether that's something that you would like to include or not. Let's go, Carrie. I'd like to add that I share the same reservations that uh, Jan just spoke about. Awesome. Um, anyone else? I would. I would agree with you, Jan. Do we have any anyone else? All right, awesome. Can they, yep. Like, yep. can they be made like half windows, not all the way, like halfway light, and then the rest? The the reason that it works well is that there's an existing hole here now. Um, you can actually see it in the classrooms. You can certainly see it on the outside of the building. It looks similar to this, where you know you, you see how it's it's. Um, boxed up. So what's what makes it um, affordable in a way is they, the, the holes already there. If we if we make half of it or just the top half, now we have to we have to build a little bit more. You have to put in a different structural angle and things like that to adjust it. So um, it, it's a good question, but it may be there'd be a, a cost adjustment if it wasn't the entire size. Um, 
I, I think this begs a little bit more discussion. Um, maybe maybe some folks can think on it and, and we can revisit it at the end of the meeting. This is, so for timing wise, this is, um, this would be one of the first things that they're going to purchase um, yes. because this is work that's happening over uh, the summer of 20, um, uh, summer of 23. Um, so if Monday night you guys say, hey, you know what, let's let's skip it. And Tuesday you all wake up and go, oh my God, we should include it. Um, you know, we can look to try to get that back in right away or something like that. But this is something that is um, one of the first things they're going to purchase because this is summer of 23 work. So, All right. I, I think I'd like to let everyone kind of, you know, stew on that. And we'll revisit this at the end of the meeting um, before we leave. And Mr. Tong, this joy, I just want you to know I agree with you as well about, um, you know, not giving the teachers the space to 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 be able to hang their things on it. So the alternative windows for me, um, I agree with you on as well. Right. I mean, I, I, I'd love to give them more light, but, you know, I struggle with wall space to put things up in and, and slide things up, 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 up onto. So, so I just want I, I to so see your point. I just want to make sure that I'm clear because I don't think we can wait. And the reason I say that is because the agenda has to be posted at least, I believe, 24 to 48 hours ahead of time. Staff will not be working on Saturday and Sunday. So that means that we have to post this tomorrow. And it's my understanding, and I can text David, that we what's published is what needs to be voted on. Understood. And then again, that's why I would like to discuss this at the end. And you know, see the rest of the presentation and let folks stew on it. So um, that's what you mean when you say at the end. Okay, I just wanted to make sure I was I was on the same page with you. I'm clear now. Okay, for sure. We can we can come back to that. And you know, again, there's always you know there's always a couple of choices, but you kind of understand why we're doing it that way. You know, you can see all these things are great, they're nice. Um, you know, the the project is under budget, but that doesn't mean let's just throw money at at, at anything we want. Um, you know, there are there are, I agree with everything you're saying. I think there's a few. Um, you know, things on here that I would, I would choose maybe above that. Um, so we can, we can wrap this part up uh, and head back to that discussion. I, I uh, do want have a question about the windows. Are, or do they open or do they, and, and when they open, if they open, do they open in or out or up? Um, I don't remember. Um, Okay. <laughs> I, let me get back to you on that. I don't remember. In, in a lot of newer schools, they are fixed. They are not operable. Um, but I remember having conversations about that with the staff there. So let me let me find out. I, I believe they are operable. Um, I'll, I'll look that up as, as we're talking, but let me um, let me verify that before we go any further. Thank you. The gym, the gym yeah. windows would not be. These would be fixed because obviously they're so big and so tall. They do not open? That was my question. Do the gym one, do any of the gym windows open? No. Okay. Um, it would be they're they're the bottom of the, the window is at eight feet in the air. So it would be difficult to uh uh to open. So the, the new HVAC um heating and air conditioning package for the gym is in there, heating and cooling. These windows um face north, which is great. So you can get a ton of natural light without any direct sunlight. Um I, I think this is is a big that's a big change. Um, that'll look like night and day if you know walking into the uh, to the gym. So um, this is one for me personally that I would have higher on the list than the you know the fourth window in the in the school. And or regarding the glass, windows right? in the gym, are those windows um, what are those the tempered glass where you know balls yes. hitting it things like that right. will just bounce and they won't break? Right. So it's um, they they are tempered where again hitting them with normal velocity things <laughs> would be fine. Um, <laughs> uh, and anything, certainly if, if there was something that, you know, say a baseball hit by, you know, Bryce Harper hits the window, um, it would spider web shadow. Um, you know, it doesn't um, break, um, you know, into a whole bunch of different, you know, pieces and things like that. Hopefully Bryce Harper's not out in the backyard hitting baseballs. Um, so the next couple of slides, you know, things that we had passed along were the results of the bid. So you can see general contractors, we had three. Uh, SB Conrad was the low here at 5.5 million. Um, mechanical, there were a lot of groups. So anywhere that it says no bid, that's a group that picked up drawings um, or came to the walkthroughs. 
and as happens, sometimes they decide to pass on the project. Um, but these are names of people that had uh, expressed interest at one point. So there were a lot for mechanical. Um, but even of the dozen or so that, that took drawings, we still had five uh, very reputable groups uh, come in. Again, you can kind of see the, the, the range of uh, cost there. Michael Mechanical here was the low. Um, then you have the electrical bids. There were two, Cedar Electric and Phillips Brothers. Phillips Brothers was the low. Uh, and then again, in plumbing, we had seven, a lot of plumbers uh, showed up. And again, that Myco Mechanical Group uh, was the low there as well. So um, how that works, again, is you're, you're choosing the lowest bidder after choosing the alternates. Now, there is no scenario where any of the alternates that you choose or don't choose would eliminate who the lowest bidder is. So sometimes that happens. You can have... Company A is the lowest, but if I take alternates three, four, and five, now company B is the lowest. There are no scenarios where if you took all the alternates, if you took none of them, if you took some of them, there's no time where taking any of them would change any of that. So that's important to note as well. So this was the summary. Um, again, SB Conrad for general, Myco for plumbing and mechanical, Phyllis Brothers for electric. This summary shows all the alternates taken uh, that's the value at 13657000 If we decide to take a few out, and that's totally fine, um, that number would obviously lower. Um, but to Dr. Picos's point, tomorrow we want to be able to provide you with a motion, four different motions, four different contracts, general contract to SB Conrad for X, mechanical contract to Michael Mechanical for X. Uh, so those are the motions you'll be you'll be um, making uh, considering uh, Monday night, but we want to um, you know, publish them tomorrow. Uh, we did ask all three. Again, Maiko is is taking on the role of two things. Um, all three contractors for um, their diversity, equity, inclusion statements. Um, Maiko Mechanical has a little bit of a um, kind of a. a corporate line of things where they talk about um, uh, experiences and capabilities, uh, all their letters uh, and everything had been uh, sent to you guys. Um, Conrad, again, is a local um, uh, contractor. They note that about 60% of the jobs uh, they believe will be coming from Delaware County. Um, and then Phillips Brothers had uh, an affirmative action plan um, where they're talking about um, how they believe they are um, uh, facilitating your concerns and, and questions about um, diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, so that's it. That's the summary. This was, um, oh, I'm sorry. This is the summary of the, the project uh, summary to date. So uh, again, we had an estimate in um, October of basically 15 million, 14.9. Uh, with a bid received and all the alternates, we're at 13.6. So again, this number goes down if we choose less of the alternates. Uh, the total project cost is about 16 and a half. That includes um, $750,000 for construction contingency. What that means is this is money we set to set aside because there's going to be things that come up. They're going to take a ceiling down. We're going to find a hole someplace, and they're going to say, we should really fix that. It's $2,000. Okay, great. Those are called change orders. Um, oftentimes, change orders are things that are recommended, things that should be included, um, things that, that people find kind of along the way. So we're holding $700,000. That's a lot. I hope we don't use two-thirds of that. <laughs> but there, you know, we may find some things along the way uh, that need to be added into this construction number um, during the construction process. So we're saying... Put this aside right now, just in case. There's an additional $2 million in soft costs. That includes the abatement number at Evans. The very first thing that's happening this summer uh, is the asbestos abatement at Evans. That's a, another contract that you guys have already uh, agreed to and are moving ahead with. There are uh, dollar amounts for um, architectural and engineering design services. Those are things you have been paying uh, and will kind of wrap up as construction goes. Uh, we're holding about 5% for permit fees. Um, that would be between the two municipalities, East Lansdowne and Yaden. That's another next step is to go to them to get the building permits. Hopefully at that time, we can oftentimes negotiate that number down. 
Um, oftentimes, local municipalities have uh, a, a dollar per square foot or a percentage of construction costs because they're looking at somebody putting a, a deck on the back of their house. So it's going to be $3,000 to put a deck on the back of your house. That's a pretty cheap deck. Um, at 5%, that's a $200 fee. Okay, great. That's That pays for somebody to come out, just make sure it meets code. When we're doing massive building projects like this, that starts to equate to hundreds of thousands of dollars. That's more certainly more than it's going to cost the municipality to come out and inspect those things. So oftentimes there's agreements and we will work with, with both municipalities to do that, um, to say, hey, listen, what do you think the costs are for your code guys to come out during the next 16 months? We think that's $75,000 each. Okay, great. Let's pay that. And then that would greatly reduce that $600,000. But today I'm telling you, let's we need to make sure we hold on to that. We're also holding other uh, things for moving expenses, legal expenses, reimbursable expenses, um, and, and several other things that could be in charge in, in soft costs. So we know, we know you're committing to the construction costs. We're telling you to hold on to um, uh, the remaining value here. Um, and um, some of that money will be spent uh, during the construction uh, duration. Mike, can you go back to the alternate uh, false slide? Because um, I know you went through some of those projects, but did you go through all of them? Which which costs slide? The the alternates or just the, the alternate, overall? Right. You just passed it. That one. There. So you did the gym, the classroom, replacing the windows at Evans. Mm -hmm. No, it's windows at East Lansdowne. It's casework at Evans. Mm -hmm. um, so then it's the... All. Yes, then there's, um, that's in every classroom at Evans. Uh, then there's the the heating units that are kind of um, in, we'll call them common spaces. Um, there's the two big uh, heating units at the, the kitchens in the, um, uh, at both schools again. And then there's the the added air cleaning um, uh, in, in those units um, in the classrooms and, and really everywhere, actually, the gym units have them too. Okay, thank you. So that that's how you get from um, twelve million nine hundred and sixty six thousand, which is the base bid uh, of bids that came in uh, to thirteen six fifty seven. So that's thirteen six fifty seven is the highest we can go. Uh, twelve point nine would be the lowest. I'm with you. Thank you. Okay, Mike. Before you leave that page, the casework at Evans. That's the window casing. Is that what that is? The casework. Yeah, so the casework at Evans is along the corridor wall. Oh, the okay. Um, so every classroom has a sink. Most of them don't work. Um, so this would be replacing the sink with one that does work uh, and also one that's ADA compliant. What that means is there's nothing underneath this. So if I'm in a wheelchair, I can kind of roll underneath it. Um, and then, you know, you're kind of replacing the base cabinets, which is what they have now, even though they're kind of, some of them were, were in some some bad condition here. Um, with all new all new base cabinets, uh, a teacher's wardrobe, which is like a large bookshelf um, with storage inside it, uh, and then uh, some open shelving here, and then some closed door shelving uh, up top. So um, where they don't have any shelving here now, um, you'd have a whole lot more storage. Mike, it's Joy. Um, I got a question regarding the, uh, what, did, what was the word you use? Um, change order yes. now with all those bidders did you get like samples of what their change their recent change orders with other projects that they had so that we can get an idea of what you know how they you know i guess how their change orders look and how how much um money that they asked for in those change orders and if not is there a possibility that we could get that so that's a very complicated question um change orders are things that it doesn't necessarily mean that it's a contractor, a bad contractor. Um, a change order means it's something that wasn't in the bidding documents. Um, there may be something we missed and we will attest to that. So we come and go, hey, you know what? We were supposed to add something here. Um, that should be included. This is something that should be included in the project. They go, okay, here's what we think that costs. We negotiate with them and then explain that to the board and say, hey, here's something that should have been included. This is something that in it. oftentimes 
<laughs> again, excuse me. Um, oftentimes it can be things that, again, you open something up and go, whoa, that's a problem. There should be um, added structure there. I, I always, um, I used to have a slide for this. Uh, we did a, a high school project once and they opened up a wall. The column was hanging from the beam above. It actually wasn't touching the floor. So it wasn't doing anything. It was, I don't know even how they would have been able to install that. Obviously that's something that needs to be fixed. We, our structural engineer came in, we took a look, they pushed, patched everything together uh, and came up with a, a solution of, of something that was an obvious structural concern that needed to be fixed. We're, we may find some of those things as we open up ceilings and roofs and things like that. Um, so to and be fair I'm to not them- saying that it's, it, you know, that because they do change orders, it is bad. N not my thought process at all. Okay. What my thought process is, is what types of things, what do they do? How do they, um, um, how often are they asking for change orders? You know, just because you ask for one or two or three or four does not make you a bad contractor. Mm -hmm. It is what is being asked and how often it is being asked. So I would really like to know with these contractors, what are those types of things when they look at in their chain, you know, when, when they offer change orders and what are we as board are looking at when they so happen to may have present this to us? So we will be presenting those. Uh, that's a good question. We will be presenting those um, within summaries every month. So every month you're going to see here's uh, uh, change orders that were requested. Um, a lot of times they're denied. They'll say, "Hey, we want money for this," and we go, "No, no, no." On page seven, it's in there. You you own it. You can't get extra money for that. Um, so we'll show you every one that was requested and every one that was approved. So essentially we would approve those, come back to the board and say, here's a list of some things, here's why. Um, again, there are uh, sometimes unforeseen conditions. Sometimes there's things that were, um, again, admittedly missed in, in drawings, um, but we will go through each one of those and, and describe the, the reason for that. Um, so that's where it would be a tough question to the contractors to say, you know, how many change orders do you have typically? It's like, well, I don't know how, you know, in, in a brand new building, not as many as in a renovation, because in a renovation, you tend to, you know, uncover some things along the way that need to be, um, need to be fixed. We've worked with all three of these guys, um, the change orders and things that they present, um, if they are accepted, uh, are, are typically acceptable. They go, yep, that's, that's something that needed to be moved, or you know what, that is something that, you know, now that that's opened up, we should upgrade this piece as, as well. Um, you know, especially things like electrical and mechanical, they may find uh, some things along the way and go, hey, listen, this isn't included in our bid, but this really should be looked at. And, and our engineers can look at that, go, yeah, 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 that's probably a good idea. It's $8,000. Okay, again, we don't want to spend, just because we have $750,000 budgeted does not mean we want to spend any of it. Uh, so every dollar that is considered um, a, a change order that we bring to the board is going to be scrutinized over. Um, not only by the contractors, but certainly by us before we present that to the board. So again, it, it would be a tough question to uh, to pose to the contractors, but I can vouch for all three of them and say, you know, again, we're working with all of them right now, and they they all seem to be in, in good relationships with uh, uh, with the projects. Everything seems to be fair. Okay, Mike, I just have a question in regards to what you were saying um, in terms of you're approving the change orders. How does that work if there was an error, not on our part, but on the contractor or any other part? How does that cost um, work? Is it gonna automatically be pushed onto us or do they take any ownership in that missed, you know, possibly missed item? How, does, how, do, how do we benefit where we're not incurring all those missed costs? It's a great question. And actually the very first question we will be posing to you as the construction starts. So oftentimes there is a project representative from the district that can speak for the board. And that's somebody that we should talk about either hiring or identifying um, so that um, we don't have to wait every month for a board meeting to approve some things. Because oftentimes these things are gonna come up, hey, this wall's open, do you want this fixed or not? Uh, and we may need to react quicker than we can in a month. Um, a lot of times school boards will set a limit. It says, yes, you can architect, you can approve anything under $15,000 or $10,000. Um, 
you're going to have to come and tell us why you approved it. Um, and, uh, you know, you, we, we want to make sure that your, our district representation knows that it's not like I can just say yes and, um, spend your money without talking to you. Um, but we can, we can have between us and, and your district representative can approve certain change orders under a certain amount and then present them to the board. Here's why it was, here's, here's the reasons and all those other things. Um, if it's more than that, we may have to wait. If it's some big change order, then we'd have to come back and say, nope, that, that's over the threshold. We're going to have to wait until the next board meeting uh, for board approval for that. Um, so that is typically how that would run. That's a question that we're going to have for you guys uh, moving forward in our first construction meeting with you. Um, who is that person? Is it a board member? Is it uh, a facilities director? Is it somebody, um, you know, a third party group that um, wants to be that representative uh, to answer those questions along the way? Any errors to your point, um, if the contractor screws it up, they got to rip Thank it back out and do it again. It's their cause. Um, not very often, but I will admit there are times where something gets installed because we told them to do it and it's not right. And they go, hey, listen, all right, if we're going to tear it out and take it back out, you know, here's a cost to that. And then there's some financial obligation on our end uh, for those things. So if it's if it's a mistake that we make and we told them you should put in something that's six feet tall, they install it and we go, oh, wait, that was supposed to be seven feet tall. That's on us. Um, so we would come back and say, hey, here's the difference. Here's the costs. We, we took this responsibility financially from that. So um, you should not be responsible for um, all errors. Um, certainly if there's a contractor that makes a mistake, that's again, where, where we come in. We, we're still here during construction. Um, you know, we're still uh, helping to make sure um, what is constructed is, is um, what everyone expects. Does that answer your question, Wadia? Yes, thank you. Awesome. Any other questions and concerns for Mike from the board members? We have some um, participants on the line. Uh, do any of you have questions for Mike so far? Jan, I do not see any hands up. All right, and I think we have one more slide, correct, Mike? Um, that was that was it. Um, again, we can go back. This was the the last uh, piece here. Again, um, we got the bids on Tuesday. We're talking about them tonight. You know, the board is going to consider um, moving ahead with contracts at at that time. Is it expected? It is expected to. Um, have the alternates chosen. So if you are up for it, um, we can have that discussion now and, and move ahead. Uh, as I said, that doesn't mean um, we can't add things in the future. Um, sometimes change orders are add. You may show up one day and go, hey, you know what? We think we need this. The board talks about it and we add something to the project. Um, but we do need to, uh, if you're publishing your, your board agenda tomorrow, um, the amounts need to be included. So um, if you're up for it, we can have that discussion about um, about that now. And again, in February, we'll meet with with district representation and the contractors to set the phasing. In the spring, we'll meet with teachers again to coordinate. You know what's happening over the summer. We did talk to uh, Evans teachers about moving all their stuff out. We talked about East Lansdowne teachers about moving their stuff away from uh, the exterior wall this summer. Um, so we'll go back and meet with teachers again this spring to finalize all the things that are. Uh, going to happen and when. Um, yeah, that is the last slide. Um, and then this summer, we're off and running. The new windows at East Lansdowne is the first big thing there, and the asbestos abatement at Evans is the, the first big thing there. Mike, so, I'm just going to act. Oh, I'm no, sorry. Go ahead. Because, no, no. I go was ahead. just going to try. I was going to suggest that we go back to the slide where the alternates are. It seemed like to me, based upon my review of the discussion, there was one alternate really where there was some discussion around. Um, but I think this these six items are the items that, that we need to say yay or nay to, or are we saying include all of them except for the ones dealing with the um, classroom windows? Because that's the one where I think, Jane, you had recommended that we not 
maybe move oh, forward with that? And there were uh, some. So, uh, you know, after looking at all of the um, alternates, I, you know, thinking about it, the casework also does something similar to what the windows at East Lansdowne do, where, you know, right now there's no cases above the, um, there's no upper, upper cabinetry where when the new work would take away that word wall. Again, it's another one of those things where, you know, it's adding different value. It's adding value, but different value. Changes good sometimes, changes bad sometimes. I don't think we're going to be happy. We're not going to make everyone happy either way. There's going to be some who are going to be elated that they got new cabinetry and, and able to put things. Then we have others who are like, well, now I've lost my word wall. But, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm struggling here with that. And I'm, I'm you know, I want to turn to um, the rest of the team here and have some discussion over those where, you know, East Lansdowne, if we put all the windows back, we get it back to what it looks like when it was originally planned without those um, bricked up wall faces in the front where it looks odd. Um, you know, again, do we want to get it back to there? Those are some questions that, I, you know, it's not, I guess, for me as an individual to answer, but uh, us as a group to move that forward to um, the larger board for that, for that vote. Uh, I, I can Mike, tell you. Mike, yes, can you clarify whether or not I was maybe, and I'm not clear. I didn't think that the casework was covering up the entire word wall. If you go back to that room at Evans, and maybe it, I'm mistaken, it covers. It's all up here, so that would cover. So, so this, it, it this would go up to the top. Go okay. Um, all right. So you'd end up with with material the whole way. Jan, to your point, um, so this is a sample of something that we could not approve Monday night. We could go back and ask them to adjust the number to just keep the low cabinets. Yes. That, that way everything low is there um, and come back with a number. So let's say in February or March, we come back and say, hey, remember this conversation we had? We approved all the contracts. Now there's a number for, let's say, 70,000 or 80,000 would certainly be less than this. Do you want to move ahead with $80,000 worth of casework? Yes. Great. Um, that's something that we could come back and add as a change order. Again, a change order isn't always bad. It's a request. Um, we could do that if you have concerns about um, too much casework. So can you, um, along those lines, where, so where I'm sitting, I like it, the casing for the bottom portion, mm. but not the top. Um, the third window where the HVAC system would be used, but not the fourth. Right. So um, the way you're recommending that we handle those differentiations are change orders? Yeah, so what I'm saying is tonight we're gonna, one, one thing that I'm hearing, tonight you're saying, you know what, we don't want that fourth window in the classroom. Just leave it like this. This is what's in the base bid. We're not gonna spend 90 extra thousand dollars. We're taking that out. Um, that, that's but fine. that would, but that would not be a change order. That's not a change. If order. the decision is made tonight, okay. I just want to make sure we are all clear. That's not a change order, right? So we we're taking, we're 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 choosing not to do something, and that's fine. Um, in option three here, we're saying, you know what, we're not going to pick option three tonight, but we'd like you to come back with a change order later and tell us how much it would cost to just do the base cabinets. Maybe the, maybe the teacher's wardrobe goes in there. Um, but just the base cabinets, not this stuff up high, and that would be X. And then we can choose whether we want to do that or not. That would be then a change order because you have now on Monday night, you're going to say, <coughs> SB Conrad, we're going to pay you X amount of money. Off you go. And then everything that's additional after that, whether you choose it or it's a mistake or, or something that we find, those are all change orders. Those are things that we're now saying, all right, we told you we were going to give you $5 million. Well, now it's Five million and twenty thousand dollars. Now it's five million and forty thousand um, dollars. So what I would do here? Can you guys see this? The Excel file? If I pull that over, or is it still the? Um, it's still the picture. Yeah, it's, it's still the picture, Mike. But Mike, but Mike, just for clarification, if the change order at Evans is to do less, then your expense would go down, not go up. Yeah. 
Okay, I, but I think yeah, you so need you to can say do it that. Either way. You can approve I think we just it need to say that so that everybody. Okay. All I, right. I would suggest um, if if you have a question about the layout of this, let's not approve it tonight, and let's come back and um, this is something that won't be installed until um, next year. Um, the windows they're they're going to want an answer right away because they're going to want to order those next week. Um, the casework we could we could wait a month. Um, so if we come back um, next month and say, here's that conversation again, here's another idea, here's what that cost is, it would certainly be less than 142000 Do you want to do that? And that's uh, something we can, we can address that. Mike, can you put up one through six again for me? Okay, so I, I would you know, move that uh, we approve one. Oops. I'm sorry, go back one, the, just the one additional classroom window at East Lansdowne, uh, number four, number five, and six, and suspend number three until such time as an estimate for simply the base cabinet work can be uh, submitted to the board. So you're saying That's one, four, right. five, and six. So we're not doing two and three. You're going to do two, but not the, uh, you're going to you'll do the HVAC window, but not the extra window. Yes, the, the two is only the extra window. Oh, okay. Two well, is only the extra window. So window. this is in the basement. The this is always happening. Right. So one, so the, one, four, five, and six, not two and three. And we'll ask them to reprice the casework at Evans with a little less. Uh, Simply for the base cabinets. cabinets. So my question before we, we get too far before, you know, um, regarding the base cabinets, how much storage is in Evans now because from the image that I saw there's a lot of things a lot of cabinetry that the teachers have brought in as well as desks shoved up against the cabinetry because they're not using it um, or it's not usable um, <clears throat> so you, in, in both the schools there's closets in the back of those classrooms um, they kind of remain they're they're not in the best shape in the world but they're fine um, so that's an area where I think they have uh, hooks and things for kids to put their jackets and things. So that back wall is always staying the same. Um, at, at both schools, nobody has anything along the exterior wall. Um, so there's really nothing there. And that's where you see some file cabinets and stuff and furniture that uh, the teachers bring in. Um, at, at Evans, you saw that low amount of, uh, small amount of casework there that's along that wall. Um, that would be replaced. Um, and at East Lansdowne, I don't believe that they have that. Um, so there, there is very limited casework in any of those in those classrooms. Um, if we if we take the cabinets off the wall at, at Evans, um, we're basically putting back what they already have uh, and not adding any any additional casework to either rooms. Again, obviously, you guys can add casework anytime you want in the future. Or, or uh, we're seeing a lot of schools now with some movable casework, um, bookshelves on casters and things like that. And that's all furniture. You can just buy that as furniture. Yeah, because the image that, you know, that you're showing shows the teacher trying to use that as extra storage areas. Um, and, you know, that, that indicates that they're trying to use, <laughs> they, they need more storage. Um, they do. It, it, Who's going to use more closet space? Every, every elementary school looks like this. This is just an elementary school. Um, they have very limited casework in, in really all of your, your schools, but certainly these two, there's very limited. They do have the closets in the back. Um, again, that's, that's a, um, that's not necessarily something that is, to be honest, part of the scope that you were giving us before. That's not an ADA issue. That's not a, um, uh, an indoor air quality issue. When when the projects are over and everything is brand new and the flooring's done and the lighting's in, um, if you want to buy more bookshelves, you can buy lots of bookshelves. Um, so those are all things that would could be considered furniture that you guys could purchase in the in the future. The only reason we were talking about um, the casework here at Evans is because it's existing. We're taking a chunk out of it. Um, and the existing that's left is in poor shape. Um, but there's a, there's a closet right there um, that remains and is, 
It's fine. And you I also said the, the sinks, most of the sinks were not functional, correct? Right. So they will all be functional when they're done. Okay. I think the goal, I think one of the goals we should also keep in mind is that, you know, you will have a new classroom, a new, somewhat of a new facility, and that we have not reduced, in, in most places, we have not reduced the amount of storage or capacity that you have. I think that's still part of the ultimate goal. And based upon, I think, what Bill recommended that the board consider moving forward with, I think would achieve that goal. I, I think the idea of coming back with a number to replace just this bottom case work, I think would be a nice idea. Agree. Great, agree. So again, back to back to Bill's suggestion here about, you know, moving ahead with one, four, five, and six. What this does is two and three are both general contractor uh, amounts. So if we go all the way to the end again, sorry. Um, and this is what I was trying to pull up. Um, this gets a little blurry, but the plumbing contract. So what you'll what you'll propose to approve on Monday will say, you know, motion for uh, Michael Mechanical to be the plumbing contractor at five hundred and fifty two thousand dollars. That remains. Um, Phillips Brothers at three million thirty thousand dollars. Michael Mechanical for Mechanical at six million. I'm sorry, four million six hundred and seventeen thousand. This SB Conrad number. What we're going to do is we're going to say no to two and three. When I do that, their their number goes from 5.458 to 4,617,000. So that would be the contract amount um, for them. Uh, so what you're looking at then as a summary, I'm sorry, um, their number would be, I'm sorry, their number for SB Conrad with those taken out is 5,226,000. Um, so those are the four contracts. The total bid amount would be 13425000 So that number goes to $13,425,000. So that would be the total of the four contracts you'd be awarding uh, on Monday night. Um, just so, so that we're, we're, we're good. And we will as soon as we're done here, what I'll do is I'll take these slides that we just showed, I'll update them and I'll send them right back to you. Um, so you can see the, the summary here of, of what you would be approving there on Monday night. So I, I just want to take a quick poll of the board members here. Uh, is it, do you think that, that the fourth window should be included? Um, just a quick poll. And I'm just going to go down the list as I see and you. Can I ask a question before sure, you do well, the poll? Yes. When you're talking about the windows, it's my understanding that this doesn't take away from any dimensions of the room itself. And more, with more or less the storage space we're talking about. Yes. Yeah, so at at East Lansdowne, that's what this room is. This wall has no insulation on it. So this summer, what they're going to do is they're going to they're going to take this window out, put a new window in. They're going to take this window out, put a new window in. They're going to take this block out and put a new window frame in that'll have a louver. They'll actually going to move the um, air conditioner into that for the next academic year until the new unit sits there. But then they're going to spray insulation on this wall, and then they're going to put new drywall. Well, they'll have metal studs. There'll be new drywall with electrical outlets behind it uh, in front of that wall. So they're going to lose five and a half inches um, off, the, um, off the perimeter wall of the space. Other than that, there is no walls that are moving. They're not losing any space anywhere. The window doesn't cause any loss of area, floor area. Um, what it does is you lose wall area. Um, you know, all of these, you know, little pictures and stuff would, would go away if they, if you threw a window there. Essentially, the only square footage you're using is the space of the studs and, and the, the, the drywall. Yes. So let me understand. So you're just, there won't be a wall to put pictures or yes. pictures of that nature. It'll it'll be drywall, it won't be block. Um, and it'll have insulation behind it, which is what these walls don't currently have. 
Um, so right now you have you have uh, brick on the outside and block. So there's no insulation anywhere. And cold air on the outside just coming right on through. The window is not insulated. So cold air hits it, comes right on through. So we're going to replace that window with an insulated window. We're going to replace the wall with insulation on the exterior. Now you've got a much better winter jacket on um, the entire building um, for you know your heating and cooling um, inside the building. So your this wall will look like a painted drywall wall um, at the end of this summer. So Mike, I, I have one more question. It's it's not really germane to this, but partially is. Was there ever an analysis of the energy cost savings by adding the insulation and the in, insulated windows? Um, I don't know about the savings, but I know about the energy consumption of the building. And that was imperative to do that. Otherwise this unit had to get bigger. Um, so I can ask about a monetary- yeah, I guess I'll just say, you know, if, if we're adding uh, better windows and insulation, thing like that, if we spend, you know, just round numbers, $100,000 a year on electricity, by what percentage could we expect to reduce those costs? Yeah, a lot of times things like that is, you know, 10, 15%. I mean, I can ask our engineers as well. I mean, it's not, again, it's not gonna pay for the, not gonna pay for the uh, uh, the project, um, but it's, you will see a, a sizable uh, difference in your utility bill. Um, Thank you. Again, you're, you're, you're adding a new system so sometimes we create an, a new energy efficient system in a building and your utility costs go up and we goes, wait, I thought our costs were coming down. And we're like, well, they went up because you don't have air conditioning now. So you we're adding a quality to that space. Um, so, it, well, it's not going to be an apples to apples one to one um, because you're adding a completely new thing. We do know that the building will be much more energy efficient um, than it was in the past. Uh, and certainly the system is is much uh, more efficient and better in quality. So uh, just another quick question, Mike. So the if you're adding a wall to, you know, that thin layer of, of um, insulation, is that going to go above that drop ceiling all the way to the top and yep. into the uh, closet uh, along that, those walls as well? Yep. It's the whole... Um, it goes so this summer they're going to take the ceilings out. Um, it's kind of the opposite. Uh, East lands down, they're going to take the, the, the ceilings out and, and redo the wall. At, at Evans, they're redoing the floor. Um, so it's two different buildings, two different focuses this summer. But they'll take the, the, the ceiling out. Uh, when they come back this summer, there'll be uh, a new wall there, there'll be new windows, there'll be new ceilings, there'll be new lighting, um, there'll be diffusers in the ceiling like where, where air will come out, but no air will be coming out of it until the summer of 24. So all of that duct work, all of that stuff is gonna be installed. It's just that we know if we ordered that unit today, it wouldn't get here for about 12 months. Um, so knowing that we planned all those things ahead of time. Um, so the space will look nice, but this, this um, mechanical unit sitting here, that's right now heating and cool, it's just heating that stays. So this will heat the room for the academic year of 23-24. This air conditioner is going to move over here. It will cool the room 23-24. In the summer of 24, this new unit comes in, this comes out, they'll insulate this wall and patch that wall and plug everything into the new ductwork and things that's our, that will be installed in the ceiling. So it seems a little strange, but just kind of how long it takes for things to, uh, to occur. Awesome. Um, so I, again, I just want to go around and see if folks at this um, want to want want the additional window at East Lansdowne, if, if that's uh, a consideration for tonight. Again, we can always come back and visit it, um, but for tonight, we're, we're I would just want to take a quick poll and see how uh, if, if that's if that is a consideration for tonight. As I'm going down my panelist list, I get to Jen first. Jen, do you have any um, thoughts I'm, on? I'm okay without the fourth window and with lower classroom casework at Evans. Okay, thank you. Ms. Cook Henry? I'm the same. All right, awesome. Mr. Callahan? 
I have no problem removing the fourth window from the construction schedule. And and while we're at it, we had two uh, comments about the casework. Do you have any thoughts on that? Uh, we should suspend that until such time as a a, a uh, updated construction calls for simply uh, updating the base casement. Okay, not the upper. Awesome, thank you, uh, Ms. Hopkins. Ms. Hopkins is not there. Uh, Wadia. I'm okay without the window, number two. And number three, I'm okay with uh, as long as the cost is reduced with the, as long as we get a, a cost. Okay, so you're, you're, you, you would like to also see the cost of uh, just the lower cabinets as well. Correct, to make the things ADA compliant. Okay. All right, so uh, again, I, I think oh, um, with, with the, the other two board members, uh, Bill and Wadia, are you okay with one, four, five, and six moving forward? Yes. Yes, and three also is once we get the cost. Right, one, uh, two and three, um, two, you know, we are not moving forward. Three, can we get a cost on what the lower um, cabinet tree would look like, uh, the cost for that? That's not going to be before you need to vote, though. Uh, understood. And, and uh, as, as Mike said, that could probably wait a month and we can do that as a change order. No um, problem. And Jan, I just wanted to bring to your attention, although our screen has Jennifer twice, Ms. Richardson is on the um, Zoom. Oh, I'm sorry. And you did not call her. That's all right. <laughs> I didn't see your name. I guess that... that... <laughs> Because she sent me the link. That's okay, Jen. <laughs> Ms. Okay, Jen. I'm sorry. That's okay, Jen. That's okay. I, I'm in agreement with the majority, you know, but I, I'm just thinking of you're talking about change orders, but then we want to right away that would be a change order if we wait and go back. But I'm okay with the majority. Uh, and Ms. Uh, Richardson, I would just add that that change order is going to reduce costs, not increase it. Okay. Okay. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Um, on that topic, I think we, I, I think you guys have uh, the items you need. Correct, Mike and Dr. B. Coates. Yes. I think we're good. Did the, did the screen switch over to the Excel file this time? Yes. We see the cost, yes. You can see here then what I did in, in these two, I said no to both of these change orders. So that changes that number. If you can read that for the general contractor uh, to 5,226,000. So these numbers are the four that you would be approving Monday night to, for the total of 13,425,000. Um, and then we'll hit next steps with casework and other things like that. But this would be the... Um, this will be the summary I'll, I'll send to, to Dr. B. Coates and um, Mr. Cuff right now, and, and um, uh, this will be what you have for tomorrow. Thank you. And moving on to the next item on our agenda, um, we have a motion to consider. Jeff, can you, thank you. So I want to bring this to the um, group and have a, uh, a discussion. So this is uh, the request Mr. Callahan asked to be placed on our next agenda. This is adding four additional classrooms at East Lansdowne uh, apart from the other two schools. And uh, this is a draft of the motion. We can adjust it. But I wanted the discussion tonight to see if, uh, you know, where we all stand. I'm going to open the floor to board members for comments. Jan, I would just offer that my um, opinion has not changed. Thank you. Your opinion has not changed, and that opinion was that uh, a no, correct? Correct. Thank you. Any other comments? But my only <laughs> comment would be that uh, uh, 
obviously it, it, it's been expressed to me by at least one board member that uh, separating East Lansdowne, which is a known quantity in terms of uh, cost and necessity, uh, would be easier to approve uh, if they were separated from the other two. So, uh, you know, I've been to the basement, I've seen what's down there. Uh, the live birth study, which the board requested, uh, has proven out that uh, in the opinion of, of the administration that the classrooms are necessary and that uh, we should move forward, especially since, uh, uh, I mean, uh, off the bat, there's already appears to be an additional savings of 1.2 million uh, and we should do the work uh, at uh, as close to the completion of the other construction, which is being approved. That's my opinion. Thank you, Bill. Ms. Ms. Ivory. Hi, I would um, say I would disagree. Um, in my opinion, we voted no to this item already twice, I believe. Um, and if we're sticking with what we originally said, we were going to focus on the ADA compliance. Um, I would say no, not at this time. Needing to be done, but not at this time. Okay. Any other thoughts? Any other? Mr. Tong? Yes, ma'am. Um, Mike, will the elevator go to the basement? Yes. Uh, as part of this ESSER fund project, it uh, has four stops. It's on the second floor. It goes to the stage level. It also goes to the first floor and it, get, it does go to the basement. So the entire basement will be accessible? Yes. Okay. Um, in spite of that, I'm going to stick with, we currently at this school have children in basements. Um, I would encourage school board directors to go look at those classrooms and um, see their um, route to get to them uh, and uh, the condition of those classrooms, even though those classrooms have, have conditions that have improved. Um, I think they're very uh, distinctly um, not acceptable given the other classrooms in our district. We still have children in a trailer at this school, I believe. Um, and the uh, live birth report proves out that it's um, over capacity now and will continue to be over capacity. And I do not wish to get to the end of a two year project with our parents and um, not have a school that meets their needs. All right. Any other thoughts from the board members? But I would encourage school board directors to go see those classrooms. Um, I think you might have a change of opinion when you saw them. So no other comments. Uh, any comments from the attendees? Well, let me, can I make a comment yes. here before yes. you go? <laughs> there was data. The study was done that says that these classrooms were needed. And I don't think we're talking about right away doing those classrooms. So, I mean, if the study supports that, then why not? That's my comment. And so, Ms. Luella, for, I mean, I'll just respond to your question. Um, I believe the classrooms um, and I support the classrooms. Again, there were some priorities that we established and um, for throughout the district. Um, and so I am not voting against the four classrooms. It is just not at this time. So I cannot um, express that enough that um, that's my standing on this issue. And just as an, um, a follow-up, um, Ms. Hopkins had an emergency um, and apologized for leaving and um, just wanted to share that. Thank you. All right. Um, any other comments? Yes, Jan. I'm sorry, I have my hand raised. 
I'm sorry. I, I wanted to reply because I was one that said no. Um, and in addition to what Ms. Valerie said, um, yeah, I understand we do have students in that trailer. We also have students in the trailer at Evans. And we also know we need additional space at the high school level. And when we look at the strategic plan from Dr. B. Coates, um, when we went originally started this process, we wanted to shift the district around so we could eventually move sixth grade out of the elementary schools to possibly increase our space. So I'm looking at it district-wide and looking at how the strategic plan was created, how we want to make the shift, not just for one school, but for all of them. So that when we, when we do the additions, we can make that move for all of the schools that one have trailers and also make the shift from moving the sixth grade out of the elementary schools and going forward. But we cannot do that until the high school is done. So that's why my answer is no, in addition to us voting to focus on ADA compliance. Okay. Thank one thing you. I do one thing I do just want to clarify, we are not utilizing the trailer at Evans. We did move that sixth grade population out of the building and put them into the school as a result of us moving pre-K to Walnut Street because Walnut had space. Just wanted to make sure we're, that we are all on the same page with that. Thank you. So is East Lansdowne the only school utilizing the trailer type facility? Uh -huh. It it may it may be, and I'm I and I'm Park and I'm, Lane does, I'm, okay. I'm, I'm going through the schools in my head. I think Park Lane still utilizes Park, their trailer. Park Lane still has a trailer. That's correct. So there is another school. All right. Um, I don't want to keep us all here tonight for too long, but. I do want to put this in front of um, the two board members that are on the committee to see if we can move this to a larger vote for the full full board. Ms. Wadia, do you move this forward? No. Bill, do you move this forward? Yes. I guess I'm the third member. I'm going to move this forward so that the whole uh, board can get um, the opportunity to uh, weigh in on this. So uh, we're going to move forward with this. I'm, I'm sorry, just real quick, Jen, is, is yeah. Ms. Lawala still on property? No, I'm not. She is not. So we're going to move this forward for the larger group to uh, weigh, uh, to vote on. Um, so the motion moves to the larger uh, group for next week. Um, you have that, Jeff. Awesome. Uh, if there are no other thoughts or concerns, I'm going to adjourn for the night. Thank you, everyone, for all of your time. Um, have a great bite weekend and see you all next week. Good night. Good night. Good night. Thank you, everyone.